And tonight, I think we're going to officially put to bed baptism, and uh, we're going to we're going to let we're going to get let Keith's message on the the baptizing for the dead stand until I figure out something better. Anyhow, so um, we're going to let it stand. I think it's it says it is you know I, I'm not sure that those verses you ever have it will ever have an explanation that says yeah this. I'm sure this is it right on the money. This is this answers all the questions. But um, I think Keith's is a better answer than than trying to go outside of the scripture and say, well, this was some kind of a pagan practice and Paul was, you know, bringing in that pagan practice because, you know, Keith made a point in his message that that's, that's just not something Paul did uh, typically in his epistles. So um, you probably have to look for a meaning within the verses, within the passages, instead of going outside like that. So, um, and and Keith's, if nothing else, it was a valiant effort to do so. So, um, we're going to let that one stand as it is for now. Ephesians 4, verse 4. There is one body, one spirit, even as you're called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's above all and through all and in you all. Let's bow our hearts down in a word of prayer. Our God and Father, again we do thank you for Jesus Christ and for the opportunity of looking at your word and studying together this evening. As we do so, we pray that the things said and done will honor and glorify the name of Christ and will be edifying to the saints. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, uh, tonight we're going to, you know, we've looked at a whole long extensive list of baptisms. As, as I told you at the beginning, depending on how you number them, uh, there's, there's 12, 13, 14 baptisms uh, in the Bible, uh, different ones. And, you know, you can, you can kind of lump some of them together or break them apart. But we've looked pretty much at all of them. Uh, each week we've been giving the, the, the illustration of the definition of baptism, which I think is, is a good, good, ba- good uh, way to understand it. You know, the, the, the writer uh, from 200 BC talked about making pickles, and he talked about baptizing the pickle in the vinegar uh, and in the spices. So you're, you're immersing it in there, but more than just immersing it, you're, you're causing, that immersion is causing the character and the nature of the cucumber to change to become the character and the nature of a pickle. So when we talk about baptism, it's more than just you know, immersing, because the, the root word means just to immerse, that's where people get the idea it always has to involve water, that we're immersing somebody in water. Um, but it really has to do with immersing in something to change identification. Um, so it's, it's always about identifying somebody or something with somebody or something. And uh, we've, we've, each one of the ones we've looked at, each one of the baptisms, we've talked about you know, what, what does this identify that person with or what does this identify that thing with. And that's kind of the, the, the principle that we use at each one of these. Um, tonight, we're going to look at baptisms. Go back to Mark chapter 7. Uh, these are generally, these are, are, are classified together. There's apparently were a lot of them. We're not given a description of, of what all they were, but uh, they're kind of categorized together as the traditional baptisms of the Jews. Um, so we'll just read the passage here in Mark 7. It'll help you to understand you know, what, what we mean by that or what the scripture means by that. Then came together, this is Mark 7, 1. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the traditions of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be, which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, Well said, he, well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching, the doct- teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Uh, for laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. And so he, he uh, you know, gives a, 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 an explanation there of what when we say traditional baptisms of the Jews. Um, and, and when he says, like verse 2, uh, 
they saw his disciples eat bread with defile, that is to say, unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, uh, holding the traditions of the elders. Uh, and when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. And that washing, it's not like, well, you know, like you tell your kid, wash your hands before you eat. It's not that kind of washing. It's a ceremonial washing. It's, it's, a, it's a baptism, a purification, a cleansing, like we're going to see in, in Hebrews in a minute, the, the divers washings of the law. And so when they come, why would, when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. Because in the market, they're dealing with who? Gentiles. Gentiles. So when they come back from the market, you know, they're washing their hands, not just because the market is physically a dirty place, but spiritually they've dirtied themselves by interacting with the Gentiles. So now they have to wash, be baptized to purify themselves after that. Um, Dan uh, Gross gave me a good illustration one time. The Hindus in India, of course the the river in India is the Ganges, or um, in India, that you know they, they think it's a holy river, and so they'll take their their plates and cups and all out and and dip them in the river to clean them. Now they don't really like they don't scrub them, they don't wash them, and they just dip them in the river because it, it's the act of dipping into the water that purifies it. Of course, up the stream 10 feet, there's a guy going to the bathroom in the river, and then they're dipping the, you know, their, their plates in the river down here. But, so the issue for them has nothing to do with cleanliness, as we think of it, but it has to do with, I want to purify, this river is holy, it's holy water, and I'm going to purify it. And that's kind of what's going on here with the, the Jews. Um, it's not just a matter of washing their hands or washing their vessels or washing their tables to clean the physical dirt off of them. It's a matter of, of baptizing things, um, purifying them spiritually. And of course, you see what, what he says they're doing in verse 7. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, they hold the tradition of men. So they lay aside the commandment of God, they hold the tradition of men. In verse 9, full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. So he, he's, he's making clear, you're, you're substituting my true law for your man-made law. You're substituting my principles for your own principles. You're substituting the commandments that I gave for the commandments that you gave. Um, if you go over to the book of Mark, I'm sorry, Matthew, we're in Mark. Matthew, um, you'll see he, he talks about it in Matthew chapter 15. And of course, it, in Matthew 15 uh, is, is the passage where uh, he, he deals with the woman, uh, the, the Gentile woman, and sends her away. And then, you know, finally she gets her daughter healed. Uh, so it's all in that context of, of the Gentiles and the Canaanite's daughter being healed. But at the beginning of that chapter, he says this in verse 1. Chapter 15, verse 1, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? So you're, you're, you're substituting again that tradition that you've established. You're substituting the commandments of God with your tradition. Uh, in Luke, Luke chapter number 11 and verse 38. Luke eleven thirty eight 38 is his, uh, the last mention of this uh, practice. Luke, uh, start up at verse... Um, yeah, verse 37. <clears throat> and as he spake, Luke, Luke eleven thirty-seven. 37. <clears throat> as he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him. And he went in and sat down to meet. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. 
And the Lord said unto him, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of, of ravening and wickedness. And we'll come back to that in a few minutes, but you'll, you'll recall that should remind you of another passage, in Matthew 23, where he's upbraiding the scribes and the Pharisees for, you know, you're, you're cleaning the outside of the cup and the platter, but not the inside. You're doing these things to make a, what Paul calls a fair show in the flesh, but there's no meaning to it. There's nothing on the inside that backs it up. Now, let's go over to the book of Hebrews. It is clear, and you know, since we're talking about it, we need to <clears throat> just go back and review for a minute and make sure we understand. There were many commanded baptisms of the law. Uh, it was something that, that uh, God had commanded as a part of the law. If you look in chapter 9 of Hebrews, um, begin at verse 1, then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. After the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, that which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over it, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest, alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying, that the way unto the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, that could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers' washings. And there's that term used about baptisms, washings. So when, when Jesus Christ said, or, or when the, the scribes and Pharisees said of Christ and his, his disciples, they eat with unwashed hands, this is what they're referring to, the divers' washings of the law. Um, so those divers' washings and carnal ordinances. And a carnal ordinance... Something that's carnal doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. What does what carnal refer to? Flesh. The flesh. It's just, it means it's part of the flesh. It doesn't mean it's bad. You know, when you eat food, that's a carnal thing because it's feeding the flesh. It's not feeding your spirit, not feeding your soul. It's feeding your flesh. So it's a carnal thing. Um, so when he says there were carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. He's not saying those ordinances are bad things. He's just saying those ordinances are in the flesh. Those ordinances are things that you do in the flesh. And, and one of those is divers' washings. Verse 11, But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of bulls and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So Paul, or, or the writer of Hebrews, makes clear there that, you know, there's a better way coming, there's a new covenant coming, but there, there was in the old, in the figure of that that was to come, there were meats and drinks and divers washings that were part of those carnal ordinances. If you go back to the book of Exodus chapter 19, we see some of these and, and we see, you know, we, we went through it, we're not going to go through all of it again tonight, but that there were, were various... Uh, Items that were used, they baptized with water, they baptized with blood, they anointed with oil. All of those things are, are the divers' washings of the law. Um, in, in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 3, Moses went up to God. This, of course, is the beginning of the law. And, and called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, Tell the children of Israel, He has seen what I did to the Egyptians. Bury on eagles' wings, brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant he should be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine he shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and in holy nation these are the words yourself shall speak unto the children of Israel he wants that nation to be a kingdom of 
priests, ultimately. If you go over to chapter 29 of Exodus, you see the, the first priests being ordained. Exodus chapter 29 and verse number 1. And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to hallow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office. Take one young bullock and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread, and cakes unleavened, tempered with oil, and wafers unleavened, anointed with oil, of wheat and flour shalt thou make them. And thou shalt put them into one basket, and bring them in the basket with the bullock and the two rams. And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt wash them with water." And thou shalt take the garments and put uh, put upon Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastplate and gird him with the curious girdle of the ephod. Thou shalt put the mitre upon his head, the holy crown upon the mitre. Thou shalt take his take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. And thou and and thou shalt bring his sons and put coats upon them. And thou shalt gird them with girdles, Aaron and his sons, and put the bonnets on them. And the priest's office shall be for theirs for a perpetual statute. And thou shalt consecrate Aaron and his sons. So they're anointed with water. You wash them with water and then you anoint them with oil. And of course the blood of the, the old covenant that's you know each day on the day of atonement. That blood is shed. That blood is placed and all of that is a part of those various washings, divers washings of the law that Israel was to keep. Uh, if you go over to the book of Numbers chapter 19 Numbers chapter 19 uh, you see another illustration of this, Numbers 19 and we looked at, actually when we went through that baptism we looked at quite a few illustrations of it just looking at a couple tonight to to remember those various, those divers washings of the law. Numbers 19, verse uh, 18. Uh, and, and a clean person shall take hyssop and dip it in the water and sprinkle it upon the tent and upon all the vessels and upon the persons that were there and upon him that touched a bone or one slain or one dead or a grave. And the clean person shall sprinkle upon the unclean on the third day and on the seventh day and on the seventh day he shall purify himself and wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and shall be clean at even. So you know, here's the process. Someone that has touched a, a dead body or a bone or, or, or a grave, here's the process to cleanse them. And it's not, again, this is not about cleansing them um, physically. It's about a spiritual cleansing. Because if you look in verse 19, and on the seventh day he shall purify himself and wash his clothes and bathe himself in water. Now, if someone has touched a dead body, and so if it's about the infection or whatever from that body, would you want to wait seven days to to, to bath to wash? No, you you go home. You know, if I trip and happen to fall on a dead body, I'm I'm headed for the shower like right now. So it's it's seven days later. Then he washes to purify himself. So it's it's not at all about. Oh, I touched a dead body, there could be disease, there could be, you know, whatever, some kind of contamination, I've got to wash. It's about this spiritual ceremonial cleansing that has to take place the third day, the seventh day. And you'll notice here, it's not just about people, but he, uh, the, verse 18, take the hyssop and dip it in water, sprinkled upon the tent and upon all the vessels and upon the persons that were there. Uh, and upon him that touched the bone or whatever. So you sprinkle it on the tent and on the vessels. So, you know, thinking back, those, those false baptisms, those traditional baptisms, they included not, you know, they washed hands, but they also washed cups and plates and vessels and all that sort of thing as a part of their traditional baptisms. Well, they get that from the law because the law had the cleansing not just of people, but of those kind of vessels, um, plates, cups, tents, whatever the case might be. But in every case, it's not, it's not just about cleansing the thing physically. It's, it's about this spiritual, ceremonial, you know, God is not a God of death, he's a God of life. So if you've come in contact with death, we've been talking about that on Sunday mornings. If you come in contact with death, you've got to purify yourself, separate yourself from that death, 
separate yourself back unto God. That's a spiritual issue, uh, not a, a physical issue of just needing to wash your hands after touching a dead body. Um, so there were those baptisms in the law. Israel, as they often would do, well, the law of God is not good enough. We need to add something to it. Um, and what we add to it, go, go back to the passage in Luke where he, uh, where he talks about the baptisms. Get Luke chapter 11 and then Matthew 23. Because as I pointed out when we were in that passage, uh, Luke chapter 11, it's, it's, a, it's a direct reference back to, to Matthew chapter 23, or direct cross-reference, I should say, um, to Matthew 23 where he is upbraiding the scribes and the Pharisees for their, their hypocrisy. Um, Luke chapter 11, verse 37, As he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him, and he went in and sat down to meet. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And the Lord said unto him, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which was within also? But rather give alms of such things as ye have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. And, and there you go, That's the, you know, all things are clean unto you. He's not talking there about well, you'll, you'll never get your hands dirty. He's talking about spiritual cleansing and, and, a, and being spiritually clean. And he's, he's pointing out, if, if your heart is right, then all things are clean unto you. And of course, Peter learns that lesson later on in the book of Acts. And Paul repeats that lesson. If your heart is right, then there's nothing that is unclean of itself. Paul says, he, he learned, I've learned there's nothing unclean of himself. Uh, and he goes on here, you know, this is kind of, this is Matthew 23, but recorded in Luke. Woe unto you Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ye ought to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye pass over judgment and the love of God. Uh, verse 43, Woe unto you Pharisees, ye love the uppermost seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets. Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are as graves which appear not, and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. So he goes on and, 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 uh, and upbraids the Pharisee here, and it starts with this. The, he comes into the Pharisee's home. The Pharisee sees him eat without baptizing first, without unwashed hands, and it causes the Pharisee to respond. He marvels that he doesn't follow those traditional baptisms to be clean, not, not physically clean, but because he's been out there among the Gentiles and now he's got to separate himself from that. And of course, back in Matthew chapter 23 <clears throat> is the passage we usually look at in this context. Um, but, but he's saying you need to clean the outside of the cup and the platter. If you look in verse 25 of Matthew 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrite! You may clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, uh, that, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity. And 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 the point there, the issue is that you're you're adding you're adding things to the law to do in the flesh. But all those things that you add to do in the flesh are not getting to the root of the law. And he, he dealt with that. He dealt with there in Luke 11, back up in verse um, 23 of Matthew 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done, and not to leave the other undone. So you've, you've omitted those weightier matters of the law, justice, judgment, and faith. You ought to have done these things, and not leave... So, so you didn't do these uh, internal things of the law, but instead you added more external things to the law. So you're, you're making all these efforts to clean up the outside when the inside is dirty. And you know, he says there, you've omitted uh, judgment, mercy, and faith. In Luke 11, he says, um, verse um, 42, But woe unto you Pharisees, for you pay tithe 
you, you, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. And that's interesting. You pass over judgment and the love of God. Um, what are the two characters of God that we always talk about? Grace and truth. Grace and truth. and you pass over God's judgment. That's truth. And you pass over his love. That's grace. So you pass over who God really is. You pass over the character and the nature of who God really is and, and, and the law is to demonstrate to you who God really is, that he's a God of justice but a God of mercy. You pass over all of that in favor of these, these, these false commandments that you make and add things to what God tells you is necessary and is required. So the, the, the traditional baptisms of the Jews are, you know, we, we've, every time we've talked about what does it identify you with? Well, if you're participating in those uh, traditional baptisms, it identifies you with nothing good as far as God's concerned. I guess you could say it identifies you with backslidden Israel, with the hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees. It identifies you with all that because you're, 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 you're you know, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You're doing all this outwardly. But inwardly you're full of dead men's bones, extortion and excess. So you, know, you could say it identifies you with the, the, the sinfulness and the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees. But it doesn't identify you with anything good at, you know, as all the baptisms that we talked about. Well, not all good, but with, with something that's of God. Whether that's identification with judgment, or identification with Christ, or identification with the little flock. It's all a work that God is doing. This is not something God is doing at all. This is just something man is doing, and you're identifying with that thing that man is doing. So that brings us to Ephesians chapter 4, where we've been starting our study each night, and get Ephesians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And with that in mind, with the idea in mind that, you know, Jesus Christ upbraided the Pharisees and the scribes for adding works of the flesh to a law that already had many works of the flesh. The law was already all about carnal ordinances. And, and so those carnal ordinances were things that Israel was to do. And they added more carnal ordinances, traditions of men, to those carnal ordinances that God had given them. Uh, in our case, Ephesians chapter 4, we've read it each week, verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Um, Paul says, here, here are the unities, here are the things that make the body of Christ the body of Christ. Here are the, the, what we need to focus on. Three of them deal with who God is, four of them deal with how God manifests himself in the dispensation of grace. Seven is the number of perfection in scripture, um, perfection in the sense of completeness, wholeness. But oftentimes when you see seven of something, you'll see it divided by three and four. So the three of this, four of this, and that makes seven. Three of them are who God, God and who he is. Verse four, one spirit. Verse five, one Lord. Verse six, one God and Father of all. So that's the who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How he's manifested in the dispensation of grace. One body, that one body has one hope. To be, to be manifested as he is, to have the veil of flesh removed and to be manifested like he is. Um, so that's the, the one body, the one hope, um, one faith is the, the, the life of Christ manifested in his word. That word is the faith delivered to Paul, delivered to the, the, uh, the, the Bible writers, the faith, not our faith in him, but the faith as a noun that is the belief structure that's in the word. That's how we have access to the life of Christ. And then one baptism, which is the thing that forms the one body by whom Jesus Christ is identified in the world uh, and, 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 um, and, and that has that one, uh, one hope to be manifested like him and, and uh, receives that life of Christ through the one faith, the word of God. So there is only one baptism. Now the one that we understand, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, there is one, the, as the body is one, and hath many members, and all members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit 
Are we all baptized into one body, whether it be Jews or Gentiles, whether it be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit? And then in verse 28, now ye are the body of Christ, or 27, uh, ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. So he, he describes in, in detail the baptism that is effective for us. The baptism that is needed for us. The baptism that takes us out of Adam and places us into Christ. And it's not a carnal ordinance like the baptisms of Israel were. It's a, it's a real spiritual transaction performed by Jesus Christ, uh, baptizing, or by the Spirit rather, baptizing us into the body of Christ. It's not a carnal ordinance. It's not a diver's washing. It's not anything we do physically. It's a real spiritual transaction. When you go over to Galatians chapter 6 uh, and, and verse 12, Paul says this, Galatians 6, 12, as, and, and he, he uses this, uh, he says this in reference to circumcision, but the same would be true in reference to uh, any physical ordinance. Uh, as, as many as desire, this is Galatians 6, 12, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. So th there are people today who constrain you to be circumcised, constrain you to be baptized, constrain you to keep whatever ordinance or ritual or rule they may come up with, that they can glory in your flesh. We've had, we had eight people baptized last Sunday, but we can glory in your flesh. Um, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cause of Christ, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh, verse 13, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And Paul writes that after he has said in chapter 3 of Galatians and verse 27, as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. If any man be in, uh, there is you know, circumcision of anything or uncircumcision, but a new creature. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if any man be in Christ, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. So this, this, Putting on Christ, becoming a new creature, is the issue. Not, not anything else. Anything else is just a ceremony. Anything else is adding to that. Anything else is making a fair show in the flesh. Anything else is exactly what Israel did. He, he told Israel, you, you are missing the spiritual point of the law. Justice, mercy, and faith, and the love and judgment of God. You're missing that in favor of all these adding more physical carnal ordinances. For us, there are no physical carnal ordinances. In fact, um, flip over to Colossians chapter 2. For us, the, the, the carnal ordinances are completely taken out of the way, and yet we try to add those back in. Colossians chapter 2, um, verse 13, And you being dead in your sins, the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together, with him having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. He took it out of the way, that, that handwriting of ordinances, even the, the ordinances that were given by God, the, the touch not, taste not. Look at verse um, 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a an holy day or of a new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So he, he, he's saying you, you have the reality of this spiritual baptism. Down in verse um, 20, if ye be dead with Christ in the rudiments of the world, and you are, he's saying, you as believers, you are dead with Christ. If you are dead with Christ, 
since you are dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world. Why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men? That's exactly what Jesus Christ said in, in, uh, in Mark chapter 7. You teach for commandments, the doctrines of men. And Paul says, if you add, touch not, taste not, handle not, do this, do that, be baptized, be circumcised, be this, be that, follow this program, follow that program, you are teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. And so, if, if, if we understand the, the danger and the problem with that teaching of those traditional baptisms of the Jews, we understand the same problem with teaching any baptism other than the one that identifies us with Christ. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And that's the baptism that takes us out of Adam, places us into Christ by one spirit into one body, the body of Christ, allows us to put on Christ, allows us to become part of the new man, the the one body of believers, and that's the real thing, if you will. We, don't, we no longer have carnal ordinances, and we don't add carnal ordinances to that that we have, because we don't do things after the commandments and doctrines of men. Just like Israel was upbraided for adding traditions, traditional baptisms to the commanded baptisms, we should not add traditional baptisms to the commanded baptism. And the commanded one is by one spirit into one body. If there's one, there's one. Um, and what is the one? By one spirit into the body of Christ. What does that do for us? It allows us to put on Christ. Do we need any, we are, the passage says we are complete in verse, um, chapter 2 verse 10. Ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. And when we put a, a requirement that's not that, then we've made a requirement. Well, you can be saved if you're not baptized, but you can't join our church if you're not baptized. Well, okay, so then you have a tougher, tougher standard than God has. God will accept me, but you won't. Um, and, and of course, it, you know, then you get into all these discussions about what kind of baptism, you know, three times forward once backwards, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, just in the name of Jesus Christ. Do you have to be immersed in the water, poured, sprinkled, as an infant, as an adult? You know, there's all the, the discussions about that could go on endlessly. And the real problem is not, you know, well, how do we do it? The real problem is we don't add anything to God's word and God's commandment. There is one baptism, and just as Israel was wrong to add other baptisms to the carnal ordinances of the law, we are wrong to add any carnal ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, be baptized, be circumcised, to the completeness that we have in Christ. So the one baptism, is our, when we studied it last week, our baptism into Christ, that's the one that Paul talks about in Ephesians 4. That's the only one we need. And adding anything else is simply, it's, 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 it's the sin of the Pharisees, which Certainly, it's not unusual for us to commit the sins of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, basically. And, of course, the church, the professing church, is full of hypocrisy. So, we, uh, we need to, to not follow the pharisaical pattern in hypocrisy and hold just to the one baptism and not add other baptisms to it. So, hopefully, that's everything you ever want to know about baptism. We're afraid to ask. All right. So, are there any other questions about uh, any of the any of the stuff we've talked about with baptisms the whole way through this long and arduous study? Or if you have a question about Keith's baptism for the dead, he can answer that one. So, anything? All right. So it's clear as mud. Then that's good. I do have a question. I don't know. Why is Paul baptized this? There's 12 Jews in that. Yeah. That's a... That, well, he... he um, Keith's talking about Acts 19, and, and Paul did baptize. I mean, there's no... I mean, maybe... Oh, you're not going to make me do another week, I hope. Because there is, there is the question that comes up. Well, Paul baptized. Paul water baptized, and he did. And, and one that Keith mentioned is Acts chapter 19. 
um, verse, uh, well, just verse 1, it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. He said unto them, Under what then were ye baptized? And they said, Under John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. You know, my question would be even more than the water baptism. Why did they get the supernatural baptism and infilling with the Holy Spirit and speak with tongues? Because that was done. That was over. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's an indication of the transitional nature of the book of Acts. Uh, we, in hindsight, we know, well, this started here, and this started here, and this started here, and this happened at this point. These, got, you know, these, these men were baptized with John's baptism, and they, they hadn't heard anything since that. John the Baptist came, said, Christ is coming, Messiah is coming, be baptized. They were baptized. You know, Christ came, the Holy Spirit came. These guys are... I don't know what they were doing, you know, but they missed the whole thing. So they they're they're saved, they're delivered from the evil nation through the baptism of John. You know, they 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 escape the wrath to come through the baptism of John, but they haven't yet received the blessing of that remnant that the, the remnant received in early Acts. They received that blessing uh, through Paul, which is obviously unique. But part of that blessing is you know, Peter's baptism, repent and be baptized, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, and they receive it. Um, and, and the book of Acts is a transitional time. You have things happening that are kingdom, you have things happening that are body of Christ, and they're, they're overlapping because these, these two groups are on the planet at the same time. They're not, they're not both preaching the gospel message, but and these men in Acts 19 are not getting saved... They were saved how? By, John's, by, believing. By, by believing, but through what process? Through John's baptism. That's what they believed. We believed the message of John and, and went to his baptism. and That's how we got saved. The message of John saved us. So they're not hearing the kingdom gospel for the first time. They're receiving the blessing of the kingdom that they hadn't received yet, which was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit when they're water baptized. So, you know, same thing. Paul um, baptizes the Philippian jailer um, in Acts 16, verse um, oh, verse 29, and he called for a light. This is a Philippian jailer calling for a light, and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him all the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straight away. So there Paul baptizes the Philippian jailer and all his house. Um, again, he's, he's coming out of something that, that he understood, uh, into something that he doesn't completely understand yet. And he, he baptizes the Philippian jailer. Um, when you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul acknowledges what he did in Corinth. And he says in verse um, 14 of 1 Corinthians 1, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So he baptized the household of Stephanus, Crispus, Gaius, um, but the, you know, and he doesn't. He almost says it in a in a uh, apologetic tone. I, 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 I'm, I'm really sorry I did this because I don't want people saying I baptized in my name, um, and and I didn't come to baptize. I came to preach the gospel. Which would be hard to do if the gospel you were preaching was repent and be baptized. 
Well, so clearly the, the gospel Paul's preaching is not repent and be baptized, it's something else. It's the gospel of the grace of God. But in the transition period, and that's why it's very dangerous to get your doctrine from the book of Acts, because things are happening in the book. The book of Acts is where handkerchiefs go out from Paul and people just get, get healed all over from these handkerchiefs. So now today you've got you know, Earl Robert. Well, not Earl anymore. Richard Roberts and 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 Benny Hinn, and you know, sending out hankies to everybody and saying, "Hey, take this hanky and blow your nose in it, and you'll be better." Um, so it, it's it, it, you just the Book of Acts is a dangerous book to get your doctrine because of the transitional nature. The kingdom is 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 winding down. The dispensation of grace is is winding up, and. Things are happening there that aren't the norm for way that either the way the kingdom operated or the way the dispensation of grace operated. It wasn't the norm in either either economy. So that's what I would that's how I would explain those twelve uh, that are baptized and received the gift of the Holy Ghost in Acts nineteen. But he so. obviously was given them a king. He was given a Philippian jailer that baptism was. Part of the dispensation of grace, right? The Jews in Acts 19 was part of the kingdom. kingdom. Yes, absolutely. And then he wrote First Corinthians after that, right? After he baptized us twelve. Ah, uh, yeah, probably. So yeah, he yeah. That from Ephesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or in that time frame, anyhow. So, yeah, yeah. When he says I baptize no other, that's at Corinth. Right, right. At Corinth, I didn't baptize any other. So yeah, yeah. And he was at Corinth, I think, in Acts 18, and then he wrote later back to them. So yeah. I don't know if I answered the question or not, but it's the best I got. So. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. All right, let's have a word of prayer then and we'll be dismissed. Our God and Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, for the opportunity tonight of looking at your word and studying it together. And as we've done so, uh, we pray that the things said and done brought honor and glory to the name of Christ and we're edifying to the saints. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.